Welcome everyone. I'm excited to have you here for our Managing Up and Across webinar. This program is being sponsored by Careers Advance, a private practice specializing in professional training and development. My name is Lisa Panarello. I'm the head of Careers Advance and I will be your host. Just two things quick uh, note to note before we start. Our program is being recorded, so you'll receive it next week to review and share. And you can catch this and past webinars on Careers Advance YouTube channel. And secondly, for audio quality and time constraints, everyone is going to be kept on mute. However, your engagement is vital to the impact of this program. So I strongly encourage you to drop questions in the chat box as they arise. My goal is that you walk away not only with fundamental insights and best practices that may confirm your thinking, but new tactics that you can apply to your specific situation and help you increase your power of influence. So be sure to throw your questions in there and we'll address as many as we can. Now, where is all this wisdom going to come from? Well, I'm honored to introduce our panelists. Supreet Baines Sharma is the founder of ARC Consulting Services, a private coaching business providing curated solutions and training in areas including leadership development, strategic communication, executive presence, project management, and change management. Supreet's personal career spans 16 years at British Airways, where she progressed through global impact roles and executed large-scale organizational transformation, all while driving a better performance culture through effective recruitment, team facilitation, and learning and development initiatives. Supreet holds a BA in economics from Delhi University and graduate certificates in mass communication from Indian, Indian Institute. She is a certified PMP, SHRM Senior Certified Professional and an adjunct at the Feliciano School of Business of Montclair State University. Supreet's work has increasing relevance in today's digital world where communication and relationship building skills are key differentiators in a competitive job market. So we're really excited to have her. Next up, Kelly Maloney Frager. Kelly's the owner of KF Professional Development and Training when she partners with organizations to help them optimize the power of people through training and consulting. With an extensive career in human resources, her clients and employers have ranged a broad spectrum of industry from hospitality to professional services, mortgage banking, home building, and beyond. Kelly's primary content specialties include effective communication, interaction intelligence, I love that one, leadership essentials, workplace collaboration, and emotional intelligence. She holds a BS degree from Penn State University, has a master's in HR development from John Hopkins University, and four behavior assessment certifications with TTI. She's also a serving governor appointed six year term as chair of the board of trustees at Carroll Community College. Kelly is known for her genuine delivery of dynamic insights that help clients bring clarity and purpose and action to their work. And finally, Heath Suttleson. Heath is the president of the Project Leadership Academy, which offers a catalog of interactive and highly customized courses to project management focused enterprises. Heath's impact is felt around the world as he's conducted trainings on five continents in several languages to companies such as Harley Davidson, the World Bank, Wells Fargo, and the Project Management Institute. He's the best selling author of The Attitude Check Lessons in Leadership which several organizations have incorporated as a standard in their training programs. His team engagement expertise has landed him features and publications, including CFO Magazine and Bloomberg Business. During his 25 year career in the design and construction industry, Heath led teams in managing multi-billion dollar projects. So having worked for some great leaders and some horrible bosses, Heath knows how the subtle nuances of attitude can make all the difference in turning a manager into a leader and increasing productivity while reducing staff turnover. Once again, we have a wealth of experience and knowledge at our fingertips. And today's program, Managing Up and Across, we know it could be a difficult task. So let's dive into our conversation. My first question is around collaboration. The challenges of collaborating has been around for decades, yet, incredibly heightened in recent years with the globalization of business 
and proliferation of age, gender, and culture in the workforce, not to mention the impact of COVID. So Supreet, I'm gonna to come to you first. Can you provide some best practices for building cooperative relationships when you're operating in different time zones and different types of workplaces and you know, not getting lost in the shuffle? Absolutely. Firstly, thanks for having me here. Collaborating across geographies, as you just said, is something which is a constant challenge and COVID has further exacerbated it. If you think of distance, there's actually three kinds of distance. There is operational distance, which is to do with the organization, the way it's set up, to do with, you know, what is team bandwidth, team structures and things like that. Very little in individual control, so we put that aside. The second kind of distance is actually physical distance, and that has to do with working in different time zones, in different countries. And in a way, we already have well-developed tools for that, which have really come into play with COVID, which is around using technology, setting up structures for common meeting times, uh, making sure that you know it's something that's working for people who are in different time zones. Uh, first talking through what works well in terms of, you know, what's a good time, what's not a good time, and then creating that structure with some predictability so it creates a sense of routine for everyone and then brings the teams together to collaborate. The third one is actually the most challenging because it has to do with something called affinity. And affinity is a combination of values, trust, and interdependency. Now think about it, in a normal office situation, you would have water cooler conversations where you'd get to know your work colleagues a little bit better, or you'd have five minutes before a meeting starts and you're in a meeting room. That doesn't happen in the virtual world. So one has to be really intentional, both for virtual and for multiple geographies, to create that space for those things to occur. So the equivalent of a water cooler conversation, for example, could be that you know you finished a piece of work, do a 20 minute catch up just to celebrate success and swap stories about, you know, that got me stumped for a moment. It helps build a lot of trust when you're working with colleagues across different time zones. Another way or another approach, a really important approach there is communication. Now, communication is something we do all the time, but when we have to think of colleagues in other time zones and in other cultures, there's a few things we need to keep in mind. Number one, don't conflate brevity with the need to make your point. So brevity and clarity are actually two different things. You want to be clear, but you don't want to be that brief that you're not clear. Number two, be intentional about your communication medium. Is this a subject matter appropriate for email? Or maybe it's better that we get onto a virtual call and talk about it. Number three, create space for conversation, discussion, summarization. Many people will say, we don't need a summary, we know what's going on. But you want to hear back from people in different time zones and people in different cultures that your understanding of the matter is common and you've got the same understanding of the problem and the way you're approaching the solution. These are just a few of the ways, but they go a long way in making sure that we can collaborate well with colleagues across different geographies. You know, Saprita, I really, the two things that really will stick with me, words that you shared is one, intentional. This cuts to has to be an intentional aspect of you wanting to collaborate and making it happen. And the other piece, choosing the right mode of communication. Uh, I think we forget sometimes that we have phones <laughs> and we can pick it up. So some things are not best. Some things, yes, you can quickly write out in an email and sometimes it's, it'd be better to touch a certain subject on the phone or I am. So I think choosing the mode of communication is really a great simple tip to, to focus on. Great, thank you for that. Well, Heath, I'm gonna come to you now and take you to sort of the other side of this collaboration challenge. What techniques would you recommend for engaging knowledge and perspectives and enthusiasm of a multicultural and a multi-generational team. Right. So I'm actually going to use that, that topic of phones as a segue into that because there are people in your lives who, when you text them, they call you back on the phone. They're, they're not those people who are just going to text or email. They're, they're of an older style. Even if they're not of the oldest generation, they're, they're more old-fashioned. 
they like that person to person phone conversation which I like too, to be honest with you, because you're not waiting for someone to text back. You're, you're having a real dialogue. You can hear the vocal inflections, but you've got people in your team who are technologically savvy and people who are technologically disadvantaged. And a lot of that really does have to do with generations. You've got still some people from the greatest generation who are still in the workforce today. And those are the people who are used to reading the morning paper every day. They're used to still having their paper delivered, where now you've got people who are, you know, looking at, and I see a few people raising their hands going, yeah, that's me. Um, and you've still got some people who just look at the clickbait stuff on HuffPo and all these other web services. So how people get their information is going to be different generationally. You've got the baby boomers who are still a huge part of the workforce. They're not all retiring yet. Uh, and they're of a different culture and mindset. Than, than some of the, the greatest generation. You've got Gen X, which is now a lot of the middle management space in the workforce, and you've got millennials who are now coming more and more into the workforce. So if you don't count Gen Y, and you know, there's all these little carve outs of generational things that people like to claim. But if you look at really just four big sets of generations in the workplace right now, that in and of itself is a type of diversity. And the other type of the diversity that I'll tie into that is extrovert versus introvert. Uh, the, the pattern I'm seeing is that as we get more and more technology based with the younger folks, the, the younger generations, you're seeing a lot more people who are more introverted and like that remote conversation. They, they're, they're actually thriving in the COVID environment where they're not as bombarded by people in their physical space all the time. And they have a little bit more control over over their interruptions and they have a little bit more control over things through the virtual world. And the extroverts are going nuts because they're looking for that personal community, that personal contact, and they're, they're all secluded and, and shut out and they don't have their normal outlets. So between the generational issues, the introvert versus extrovert issues, and an introvert extrovert doesn't necessarily mean outgoing versus shy, it means where you recharge your batteries. So an introvert is somebody that really wants to be a little bit alone, that they, they recharge their batteries by, by having that quiet downtime by themselves. They can go out and be outgoing in a group, but it drains their batteries very quickly and they need that time to go into their cave and recharge. And then extroverts are people who really recharge by going out and being among a group. So being alone drains their batteries and then going out and being with a group of friends or being with a group of colleagues is where they recharge their batteries. So understanding those differences is a lot of how you do your tool selection. And the biggest word for me is gonna be empathy. Try and put yourself in their position for just a moment and think what is their background? Where are they more comfortable? And how can you try and adapt a little bit to where they are uh, because the more they see you adapting to where they are, the more willing they are to adapt to where you are. And that's where you find the best common ground in the middle. You know, when I'm hearing it from both of you, that there's a lot of learning to be had if we want to collaborate well and be successful in our working relationships. And we're very focused on learning technology and learning what we have to do to do the job itself. I think uh, from what I'm getting from you two is we should shift gears a little bit and really learning about people, their communication styles and preferences so that they can learn yours as well. And that's where the empathy comes in on both sides. So I think that's a good takeaway to sort of breathe, take a moment and understand your colleagues and how they prefer to communicate in order to then come back and be able to collaborate in the style that will be effective. And Heath makes a great point about multi-generations. What happens, we have, you know, like Heath mentioned, there are four generations in the workplace at the moment. There is intergenerational conflict. And a key reason why intergenerational or multi-generational conflict happens today is because of technology. Now we know millennials are very, very savvy with technology and we know baby boomers and Gen X, well, not so much. A, a really good way to deal with that and to bridge that gap is to offer a helping hand, is to say, let's stay with the technology for communication, which is safer for you to use. So. Um, like he said, it's an aspect of empathy and perspective. You put yourself in the other person's shoes and say, maybe this works for the other person. Let's go with this. 
Yeah, I think a lot of learning can come from, uh, if anyone has t taken an assessment, it's probably already helping you. And I, and I know Kelly does work with assessments to understand your communication style, other people's communication style, their triggers, et cetera. Um, so if that's something that you're open to get really delving into some learning, I recommend taking an assessment to really kind of get more language around this collaborative learning piece. Yeah. Well, um, so I, now I want to sort of take this collaboration to another level. I want to remind everyone, if something's coming up that's relating to your situation, throw in a question. We'll address it for sure. Now, I want to take the question to the topics you may have collaboration to a different level here about pushing back. Let's face it. You could be leading a team project, but you're not the team boss. So getting the most out of people who don't report to you can be tricky waters to tread, particularly when you're under pressure to deliver a goal and you have your own way of operating. So Kelly, I'm going to come to you here. Let's say a colleague on your project team is being maybe disruptive in meetings or isn't pulling their weight. What advice can you give on how they can push back or even discipline a team member that doesn't report to them? Such a great question, Lisa, especially these days, too, as we continue to have so many more collaboration opportunities, cross-functional teams. It becomes really tricky when you are tasked with or you need to have that tough conversation with another person. And my advice here is always that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of the cure, right? And so when we go back and we think about that, anything that you can do up front to help alleviate and minimize these situations, I think is the smart thing to do. Um, so in other words, you just referred to communication style. Heath had referred to introvert, extrovert, right? So getting to know where people are, what their triggers are, what are your communication do's and don'ts. Um, and then also with the group, as, as you work on these ad hoc uh, teams or these infinity groups that we see um, happening everywhere, have those conversations in terms of what are our, ter our terms of engagement. So how will we engage one another? And so by setting that up in advance, what it does is it gives you permission to go back and have those conversations. Um, and, and if you have to have that conversation because somebody is operating outside the team and what you've set up, they're not pulling their weight, but yet you don't have the direct authority and influence over them, it's time for a conversation to take place. And those conversations can be, as I referenced, really tricky because it has to be um, something where you're respecting where they are and what they're bringing to the table and valuing as well their skills. But yet at the same time, think about what you want that conversation to look like, right? So I, I refer to Stephen Covey all the time. So his, uh, his seven habits, one of his seven habits is begin with the end in mind. What do you want that conversation to look like? And then say, you know, hey, hey, Lisa, you know, I, I would love to talk with you about some things I've observed with our team dynamics and I'm hoping to share with you and then also to get your take on that. You know, would you be open to that conversation? And so then putting it out there and sharing what you've observed, what you have seen, what you've experienced, because those are things that are coming from you. So um, while the other person will always and forever not be in our control, what we can control is kind of our business of one and how we project ourselves in those interactions and seeing what their perspective is on it. And then referring back, if you have those um, you know, terms of engagement set up in advance, referring back to those types of things. And, and ultimately, I'll just throw out there too, the best type of accountability you can have um, is peer-to-peer -peer accountability. So when your team members are all on the same page, everybody can push back and hold one another accountable. And that's like, you know, talk about a, a peak performance with a team, I think that that's really, you know, that peak performance. But know what you can influence, know what you can't influence, which is, um, you know, perhaps the other person and, and having them change their behavior, but you can influence how their behavior is being seen and share with them what you've observed and what you've experienced. The great piece of that advice is setting the expectations up at front, if you can, mm -hmm. so everyone knows they're on the same page and knowing how you want to you know, communicate to challenges and that they can come to you if there's challenges, of course, 
And then the approach of the conversation, the way, what I was getting from you is don't necessarily going into it with the discipline in mind, going into the desire to understand what they might be challenged by and yes. see, okay, let's see how we can work it out together. You know? Absolutely. And how other people might be experiencing them, right? And your, your hope is that they're open to those types of conversations and you might have to help them be open to those types of conversations. Um, you know, we never want to shame somebody into changing behavior because really like shame is at the complete bottom of, you know, any of us, if, if we hear that word shame or when we've felt shame before, like it's a really hard place to get out of. And so a better approach to things is, is to get people's commitment, right? Not compliance, because when you shame somebody, you might be able to get compliance, but you're not going to get their commitment and help move the team and the team's goals, uh, you know, forward. Yeah. Great. Now we do have a question in the chat. I'm just going to, um, I'm going to table that for a moment. I think some of the other questions that we're going to tackle, <laughs> excuse me, today will come to that. And maybe you'll have a bit more of a specific piece of question that you can throw in the chat. So I, I did, I did see it about the advance and promotion. So I'm just going to hold off and come to it a bit later, but I do appreciate the question. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, Heath, sticking with the cohesiveness topic here, what tactics would you recommend to a project leader for creating, say, a shared vision and getting others to focus on your goals when they have fires of their own to tend? Well, I think the key part of that is you don't necessarily want them to focus on your goals. You want to focus on helping them craft their goals to align with yours. So uh, the biggest mistake I see in teams is where someone who's a team leader says, this is what I need, I need, I need, I need. And if you haven't really bought that loyalty from the team yet, where they're, what they would do anything for you, then you're just focused on your own goals and they're, they're not engaged in helping you fill your goals. But if you can break things down to their goals and say, we need, Here's what the project needs. Here's what the, this effort needs. Here's what the company needs. Whatever organization you're in, you break it down piece by piece so that, you know, I'm coming to you, Lisa, and I'm saying, okay, Lisa, you know, here's what we need. You, you know, we need from you to accomplish these milestones. What do you need to accomplish them? Do you have all the tools? Do you have all the resources? What is it that you need support for to, to meet those goals? Because if you meet all your goals and, and Laura meets hers and Kelly meets hers and, you know, then all of a sudden I'm meeting my goals simply because I'm helping you meet yours. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a fundamental change in how project team leaders approach it. You know, usually they say, well, these are our goals and this is what you need to achieve. No, break it down because people listen to the radio station WIIFM, what's in it for me? Right. So you want to put things into that perspective that people can easily understand, easily see where it benefits them, easily see how they can contribute. Because the other thing that Kelly brought up really is buy-in. And, and the problem with buy-in is a lot of people don't get true buy-in, they get acquiescence. Right. They're, they're, they've got someone going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're going, well, that's buy-in. No, it really isn't. That's, that's more of a blah, blah, blah. And what you really want to be looking for is someone who buys in going, yes, if you give me these resources, if I have this much time, I can accomplish this. And that becomes what you hold them accountable to. And then if they're not being held accountable, and, and the brilliant thing about the COVID environment that it's pushed us into is it has pushed more emphasis on the tasks. So you know, there's less collaboration, there's less watching people at their desks, there's watch, there, there's less focus on, on a lot of those superfluous things that never really mattered. Now it's really about, is the work getting done? And I think another thing Kelly touched on, which is really important, is that if the work isn't getting done, your first stop is to go back to that person directly. Hey, this is still needing to be done. What can we do to support you? Do you have what you need to get this done? Do you need some additional help? Do you need some additional time? Do you need additional tools? What is it that's preventing you from getting it done? The more you can handle things on a one-on-one, -on -one, the more you're gonna build teamwork, the more you're gonna build trust, and the more you're gonna build loyalty. Because the minute you go outside and over that person to their supervisor or somebody else, then you start the finger pointing war, right? Then it's all about 
people trying to cover themselves, who did what, who didn't do what. You just want to go directly to the source, keep it in their level. What can they accomplish? What did they truly buy in to do? And, and then hold them accountable for what they agreed they would do and make sure you're getting real buy-in, not just acquiescence. You know, something at the end, you kind of tipped my thought on you saying about the finger pointing. Uh, it, and this kind of goes to back a little bit to the past question too, about how you discipline and if you're having challenges that you really choose your mode of communication carefully between the two, the CC and the BCC, if you're having problems with someone in, in the group and the team, and if you want collaboration going straight to their manager is probably not the best way to do it. So it depends on how many conversations you would have with them. So that's something to consider. Um, there's books on the subject uh, to, to uh, about the two BCC and CC function of reporting challenges. So this is something everyone could think about and I want to address the question that's come up kind of in this thread here. And Kelly, I'll bring it to you. The question is, how do you handle not being recognized in regular weekly, weekly meetings? So let's say there's three companies collaborating on a project and the meeting lead greets all the participants, but not the two support team members. Are those two people being too sensitive? Hard, hard to answer that question, right? There could be a lot of underlying issues there. And so I would say if it's something that is concerning to you and that you're feeling and you've taken the time to self-reflect um, and ask yourself, you know, why is this bothering me? Is it bothering me because I don't feel like I'm getting the appreciation um, and the recognition that I need? Is it bothering me because I don't like the person who's managing this team? Like what, you know, what is it? So you've taken time to do that self-reflection. Once you decide to move forward with that, if that's a conversation that you say, you know, this is important enough or it's bothering me enough that I am deciding intentionally to get back to that word as well, to intentionally move forward, then you can have a conversation, I think, with the, with the person. And so just to say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm really curious in terms of um, how I can have more visibility. I look at this opportunity as a great whatever development role or a great collaboration role. And so I'm wondering how I might be able to have more visibility and help support you know, this moving forward. And so bringing it up to the person, they may not even be aware that they're not doing the recognition, the acknowledgement, the appreciation. And so that's why sometimes um, I, I, I always say, don't come out with the guns firing at first, because again, you're gonna get, you're gonna get attract more flies with honey than, than, than you are with anything else, right? And so don't come out with the guns firing, but approach it that the person perhaps may not know that um, they are not um, showing what they need to show. And so it's a perfect opportunity to surface that because you might be telling yourself a story that might be very different from the story that that person has in their head. So simply by bringing it to their attention, sometimes it can be helpful. If it's um, more of a power and dynamic thing, um, I would say just know that other people own their ego. And some people always have to have the spotlight put on them and they all they have that large ego and that's okay because i always say when ego goes up power goes down right because you lose when you operate from your ego versus from your your true genuine authentic self um, where those things don't matter as much then you really have power because then you can have influence with other people and i'm that's just going to add to that okay. no go ahead Supri. thank you I'm just gonna to add to that, that many a time what happens is this problem is bigger in our head than it actually is. So, you know, we're building this in our head thinking, oh, this is the second meeting, we weren't recognized. Um, you know, I know I've done so much work, but my boss or my colleague made reference to three other people but didn't make a reference to me. Uh, like Kelly said, it could be a simple omission. And the best way to tackle it is in first a simple conversation is to simply say that, you know, let me bring it into a conversation which isn't a super emotional, supercharged conversation because the more you wait, the more super emotional it's going to get. Mm -hmm. So bring it into a quick chat and say, hey, Bill, you know, I noticed that we spoke about all these things, but this got left out. Do you think we can talk about it next time? Problem is probably going to die right there because you've got to tackle it quickly. Don't let it become bigger uh, in your head or outside. So the pull away for me from that is gaining awareness, awareness of your need, your issue with it, and then gaining awareness and understanding of their issue. So that means bringing in the ask 
And the flip side is having the confidence to, to do the ask. And if you come from a point of, I just like to understand, you'll probably learn a lot more than you did the day before. And now their response, no matter what it is, they'll be on notice now. They will be more aware that it may bother you or that they did something that was probably not appropriate, what have you. So having that difficult conversations could sometimes be easier than we think if we come at it with a, a, a drive of understanding. Yeah, I'll Great. say real quick too that to directly answer the question, no, I don't think those two people are being too sensitive uh, because it's hard to hear a whole list of people named and then you're not. Um, so what I would say is if you're their direct supervisor, uh, it might be good for you at some point on the call to say, oh, I've asked you know Bill and Jane to join us today and they're also on the call. And that way you can make sure that they're, that they're recognized and noticed. Um, and, uh, and again, as Kelly said, you know, go back to that person directly. Hey, did you know that, you know, these two people weren't mentioned? Um, because, you know, I was actually uh, dealing with someone this morning and they said something really profound that their goal and their organization is that their, their customer satisfaction should equal their employee satisfaction. Because if their employees aren't just as happy as the customers, how they serve their customers is going to be impacted. Mm. So no, they're not being too sensitive. If, if they're feeling left out after multiple meetings, then it is something that they need to be addressed because that's your team satisfaction. Great. So we got some good tips and angles here for colleague collaboration. Now let's shift the conversation towards dealing with management. Perhaps the two most difficult to work with is the micromanager and the incompetent one. And they can both sort of sap our energy and kill our productivity. So let's start with the former. None of us likes a boss who's constantly scrutinizing our work, practically standing over our shoulder, even virtually, questioning our every move, uh, request that, you know, most minuscule revisions. It's not only annoying, it, it can make us feel inept. So Supreet, we can't necessarily change how our boss managers. So what are some simple methods for reducing the stress of working with a micromanager or even building trust so they can let up? You know, especially in this kind of situation, and I think we've all faced it at one time or another where either we have, you know, we are being micromanaged or know a close friend or colleague who is being micromanaged. And we really feel that sympathy for that person. The first place to start is with yourself. So if you're being micromanaged, first thing to do is understand you have to up your inner style of leadership. So what's your inner style or your inner game of leadership? It's about what are you? What's your vision? What's your purpose? Um, are you a positive person? So have that non-judgmental self-awareness of yourself. And once you have it, you may realize that, you know, there were actually three occasions I got something wrong. So maybe my boss is kind of just being on my case a little bit because I need to get my own house in order. So that's the first step. But when you've done that first step and you realize that, no, it's not me. This is a person who essentially wants 20 updates a day, which are going to interfere with the work I'm doing because I'm just so busy updating this person. Then you've got to start setting some boundaries. Have the conversation with your boss and say, um, I'm doing this today, so I plan to check in with you at this time and this time. Does that work for you? Or um, I'm, you know, busy with this and I really, I, you understand that it's difficult to get this kind of work done without really concentrating. So please don't mind if, I, if I'm not responding to you pinging me. If it's urgent, please call me. But otherwise, I will be back and I'll circle back with you in a couple of hours. So one is set those boundaries. The second is, Micromanagement can very quickly get confrontational and you want to avoid that because this is a person you have to work with. And we can't, just like we can't choose our family, we really can't choose our bosses. So if you have to work with this person, you want to make sure that you're setting up yourself with a communication style, which is neutral. So even if your boss is getting a little hyper about a piece of work you know is really tiny and possibly not that important, you want to maintain your neutrality when you're having that discussion. The second point is involve him or her more. So instead of waiting to be asked all the time for updates, you may want to turn around and say, you know what, I have these five things to do today and I think this is priority one. You know your boss is going to agree on that, but just having built that conversation and built that bridge 
is going to make him or her trust you a little bit more. And that's what you want. You want to develop that ease of relationship when you're working, even if it's a person who's a little bit of a micromanager. So that way you can build that. The last thing I will say is use facts and use data. So this is a person who's likely to come to you and say, you don't get that done. What happened? More than anybody else who's likely to trust you to say, yeah, you know, she couldn't get to that because she had these five other things to take care of. Well, have your list of five other things ready. Uh, you want to present that data and say, yes, you know, we agreed that I would be working on this and therefore I couldn't get to this piece, but this is my plan for the next couple of days. And, you know, we'll have it out off the door by such and such time. So take a little time to plan and reflect how you want to interact and approach this micromanager and work with this person who kind of wants 20 updates for you and go for it. Most important, don't lose your sense of self-worth and your sense of this is what I bring to the table. And the minute you feel like you're in the driver's seat and I circle it back to your inner style of leadership, your inner style of leadership tells you, I'm in the driver's seat about the work I do every day. And then the more you feel in control about that, the more you're able to deal with someone who's micromanaging you all the time. Great. Yeah, the micromanaging is tough. So let's flip it to the mm -hmm. other side now. Uh, you know, we all complain, we can all complain about a boss from time to time, but there's a clear distinction between a manager with a few flaws and one who's truly ineffectual, doesn't know, you know, their industry well, or is a poor performer themselves and impacts our, our group's work product and even the company goals. So Kelly, leaving isn't always an option. So how would you recommend we deal with an incompetent boss in order to safeguard our own career and reputation? Um, excellent. And I would love to see a show of hands if anybody hits the reaction button to say, I have never had a terrible boss. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think we'll see many hands going up. We have all in our professional careers, um, as I will say, suffered through that. And, and I would challenge each of us to think back in terms of what we learned then from that situation, because I think where we get um, challenged and where we have had a terrible boss, that is a great opportunity to learn. And it's a fantastic opportunity to learn what you don't like and how you will be different as a leader and as an influencer versus this person right here. So I, I refer often to um, this business of one. And when I say business of one, um, Supreet, I think you were saying something very similar when you re referred to kind of the individual style of leadership. So just know your bosses are temporary. Your reputation stays with you forever. And so that's what I talk about when I refer to this business of one. So when you have that person who's a terrible boss, this is the time where you say to yourself, okay, so what can I influence? How can I better collaborate and work with that person? Um, and know that you're not going to change their behavior. You aren't going to be the one that's going to make them a tremendous boss to suddenly have them communicating regularly to not micromanaging, whatever um, be the case. That might not be you, but you have to work within the confines of that. And so again, you're in your circle of influence and influencing what you can do. Um, the challenge is think about those things that you can learn from the situation. What can you, what do you appreciate about that person? It's really hard when we have somebody who um, is, is not sitting well with us, especially if it's a person we have to interact with every day. It can be really tough. I mean, we spend a lot of time at work and so it can be really challenging. And it's hard then to take pen to paper, which is what I suggest that people do and write down three things that you can take away from the situation. So maybe they are super strong technically, maybe um, they are really good in terms of putting out their written communication to people and, and making it brief and succinct and think, okay, those are the things that I'm gonna take away from this relationship, but I want my reputation to be intact. And so um, it's also the perfect time for you to reach out to others within your organization to have safe people that you, um, not gossip, but you can vent to, that are trusted sources for you, that you can um, healthily have conversations with them and get that off of, of your mind as well too. And for you to reach out and find other mentors, um, either within the organization or, or perhaps outside the organization too, where you can still continue to grow and develop 
your business of one, even though you're stuck in this temporarily not great situation with um, a not so great uh, boss that you have. But those, you know, those are, I think, the things that you want to do. Find your allies, find where you can make an influence or impact and the things that you can influence. But always remember, bosses are temporary. Your reputation is yours forever. Great. I, I want to see if we can address, Kelly, this particular question. I'm going to kind of narrow it down here because it is certainly deep. Um, so we have a, a caller I should say a, an audience member here who's having a challenge with someone that they actually like and appreciate how they work. That person doesn't like them. And now they are sort of going on this tireless campaign almost against them. They're getting a lot of support for what she or he is not doing. And they're almost becoming sort of a demoter. So they're having a bit of challenge on not getting support and being left out now of collaborational roles. So the manager seems to have become, like I said, more of a demote, the managers now have been demoted. So how can you sort of deal with a manager who's got this BFF and you're sort of left out of the situation now? Hopefully I I've direct. paraphrased it uh, enough for this individual. Yeah, I think there's a, that's time for a direct conversation then. It's, you know, being so specific like that, Lisa, I think that that's, situation sounds like a time for a very direct conversation. And I think when you have those direct conversations to provide that feedback then in terms of saying, this is what I'm experiencing. This is how I'm feeling. This is the impact that it's having on me, right? So it's never the you with the finger pointing at the other person, but just to say, this is this is what I'm experiencing and this is the impact that it's having on me in terms of my productivity, what I can contribute to the team. But you have to surface the conversation um, and have it pretty directly. Um, again, it sounds like um, in that particular situation you described, there might be some deeper intention um, that's going on there that is a, a current that might be too strong. You know, and, and at some point, honestly, you have to decide what you want to do in terms of where you want to be. So if this is an unhealthy situation for you where you know you're never going to be able to make any progress or to learn those things or take away those things, then that's a time for you to, you know, say, okay, I'm going to start looking around then as, as well too, right? This is no longer a great environment for me to be in. So I'm going to start looking around, whether it's internal in the organization or outside of the organization. Great. And we might, might get some more ideas for that question. I'm thinking on in a future question here. So hold on to that, to mm -hmm. that for more. Um, thank you. All right. So let's move on with a question I have now about, bear with me, about juggling multiple priorities. I mean, let's face it, in large matrix organizations, even small family-owned businesses, you may have several supervisors to answer to. And it's often a delicate situation. You don't want to leave anyone, let anyone down, but your day is overly complicated. So help, Heath, what are tips you can provide for juggling multiple priorities of multiple bosses without burning out? Yeah, the, the critical thing there is communicate early and often. Um, make sure that everyone is very clear on, on how many people you're serving, how many departments, how many you know people, how many customers, and be as open with them as you can. So when they bring something to you, people have a tendency to, to want to know, oh, I want this right away. Well, okay, you may not be able to do that right away and your ability to prioritize and your ability to communicate is key. Where people get really upset is when you miss the deadlines that you've promised. So if you can say to them, well, look, I can't get this to you today because I've got these things going on. Can I get it to you Tuesday by three o'clock? Be specific with the time. I don't like close a business. I like a very specific time, three o'clock, five o'clock, because that's where you can hold someone actually accountable. Um, so be very clear in what you can deliver, when you can deliver it. And if you get into a situation where someone goes, no, I, I really need this right away, then have the conversation up front. Say, okay, well, I'm actually dealing with this other project from Joe and, and this is a priority for Joe and he needs it today. And Nancy needs this project by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. So you might be able to go back to Joe and Nancy and renegotiate, or you might ask that third person to go directly to Joe and Nancy and renegotiate their priorities amongst themselves and come back to you with what they want the order to be of, of when you're going to deliver these projects. But the, the best thing you can do is just be clear, be open, be communicative, 
and make sure everybody knows what you're trying to accomplish and that you are trying to serve all of them um, and without catching an attitude while doing it. Ah, the attitude, that's a big piece there. So Preet, can you give us some thoughts on the matter? Absolutely. I was uh, listening to Heath when he was saying communicate often, and that's key. And another aspect of communicating often is actually communicating with these multiple bosses what you have on your plate. So you want to tell them that I'm doing this piece of work for you, but I've also got this piece of work for Nancy, this big piece of work for Joe, so that first and foremost, they understand you're not underperforming. The second part of this is know the lay of the land. So understand the work situation. If you're working in a matrix organization and you're working for multiple bosses, they don't want everything they do. They want everything that you do. They want little pieces of what they, you do. So who wants which little piece? How does it fit in the hierarchy of work? Will help you identify which is the more important for you to tackle. Will also help you defend your decision against number three on your list when that guy comes asking and saying, oh, isn't that done? And added to that, get the three or four to communicate among themselves to say, you know, we all need Supreet's help with this piece of work. What's the best way that we can help her carve out her time so that it all gets done? And that's creating a win-win for everybody. Because more and more, like Lisa, you said, as we go into it, we're going to be working for multiple people. Now, this is even more compounded when we know virtual work is here to stay. So our time is divided up even more so. So having the clarity in communication and conversation, again, breeds that trust with your multiple bosses saying, you know, she's got it. This is how she's going about it. This is when I can expect it back. Like he said, everyone listens to the WIFM radio. So your boss knows this is when this is going to come back to my desk. I'm good. Back to you're in control. Figure it out. Do it systematically. And that will really help you. Great. Well, I think it's kind of all leading to this question. I guess we've kind of been tackling this a little bit. Is how giving feedback to your boss without jeopardizing your career really. So, you know, um, just kind of give us some examples and I won't go, gee, we've only got 10 minutes left. Boy, this is going fast. I'm sure we'd all like to tell our boss exactly what we think of them, that their obsessive cell phone use during meetings is disrespectful and that their constant interrupting is demoralizing. You know, your observations could be helpful, but when is it your place and how can you be frank with your boss without putting your relationship at risk? So Kelly, just maybe about 30 seconds, what communication tips can you offer in this regard? So quickly, I would say every, every communications uh, or, or potential situation that you have, you have an opportunity to either build the relationship, sink the relationship, or maintain the relationship. And so you need to ask yourself that question in advance before you give feedback. Is this going to build how I'm going to approach this? Is this going to build, build it, sink it, or maintain it? And you have to be okay with whatever that possible outcome can be based, based on your intentional communication. The other thing I would say to consider is how much of an emotional bank account have you built up with this person? So in other words, referring back to Covey's work with that emotional bank account again, have you made enough deposits in your what I call human capital um, with this person, with your boss, in order for you to then give some feedback and to approach that conversation with, hey, you know, uh, Heath, I would I would be would, would love to to share with you what I'm experiencing here, and I'm hoping that you'd be open to some feedback that I have based on some observations because I know that you help make me my best. I want to help make you your best. Um, and we're all here for the betterment of serving our clients. And so I'm hoping we can have a, an honest conversation about that. Would you be okay with that? You know, what, what is Heath going to say? Like, no, Kelly, <laughs> right? He's, he's, he, so again, you need to know your audience well enough to know how to approach that and what's genuine and authentic coming from you, but making sure that you have enough deposits in the emotional bank account. Because if you try in any situation, boss aside, if you try and give that feedback with not enough deposits in the emotional bank account, it's not going to, you know, to go well for you. And they need to feel safe in receiving that feedback and that you're not judging, but you're, we're all trying to help each other grow and, and develop. And, and here's what I'm observing. Here's what I'm, you know, taking away and experiencing from this. And I thought you'd want to know, because I know you're always learning and, and open to uh, growing. 
you know, I have a, a book that I'll recommend. I'll, I have it get it off my shelf in a second. I'll throw it in the, uh, the chat box for everyone. It is about having these difficult conversations. I just thought of it. So I'll throw that to you in a second. You know what? We have a, a question, Heath, that I want to kick your way. Our audience member says, how do you manage a supervisor who you've been communicative with, but it doesn't seem to be working out? You've had meetings with the direct supervisor and your supervisor's manager, but doesn't seem to open up this understanding. So what's that next level of effort that this person can take? So a lot of it really comes down to style. Um, so, you know, there's some people out there that are like, oh, well, I believe in brutal honesty. When I hear that, I find those people are more interested in being brutal than honest. Right. I prefer diplomacy. And what I define diplomacy is the ability to tell someone to go to hell and make them look forward to the trip. Right. So it's it's in how you tell somebody what it is they need to know. Um, and, and as Kelly said earlier, it's a lot about your reputation. Right. You can be the reputation of telling people what they what they want to hear or the reputation of telling people what they need to hear. And I would prefer to be the type of person who tells them what they need to hear, but in a way that they appreciate hearing it. So a lot of times, for example, like I might go up to my, my direct boss and say, look, my feathers are a little ruffled, right? So own, and you heard Kelly refer to this a little while ago about what she was feeling, what she was experiencing. Own your feelings, own your perspective. My feelings were a little ruffled. Maybe I'm being oversensitive, but this is what it felt like. This is why I'm responding to what I'm responding to. And, you know, can we, can we talk about this? Because when you do that, when you own your feelings, you're not putting the other person on the defensive. And that's what you really want to avoid is putting that person on the defensive. Um, remember that bosses are like parents, right? So parents don't always take a class in learning how to parent. They go back to their previous parents and, th and think what those people did that worked or didn't work, and they try to replicate and emulate those things. People are doing the same things as managers and bosses. They haven't necessarily taken classes. They haven't taken seminars and, and how to become a better boss. They're emulating what they've seen before, just like parents do. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. So a little bit of understanding, a little bit of empathy, and a little bit of trying to not put the other person, you don't have to circle you know, around it too much, but just try not to put them on the defensive right away and you'll probably have a much better outcome in your conversations. That's great. Um, God, you know, you're all just giving such fundamental and also progressive strategies for managing up and across that we can apply to a variety of workplace situations. Now we had a question earlier that I think this next question is going to tackle. So uh, let me just go to their question real quick. Uh, it had to do about how do you sort of manage relationships in a way to advance and get promoted in this whole COVID world? And I think it kind of ties right into my, my last question about presenting problems and opportunities. So I'm gonna split this into two. On one, we've got about five minutes left. I'm gonna hit this to you, Supreme. Your project went over budget, your ideas failed, your customer sent the wrong report. Your competitor beat you to the market. These are all difficult messages to deliver to management. And you certainly want to, you know, it, it, it's, it feels like a progress halting circumstance. So Supreet, how can we truly frame a negative situation or a problem and deal with the backlash in a way that doesn't crush our reputation? Is it about mindset or tactics? So I would say the first thing is, Take a deep breath, get a cup of coffee, calm down. We know problems happen. We know there's going to be bumps on the road and you've hit a bump on the road. But if you want to tackle it effectively, you're not going to do it in reaction mode. Once you've got yourself in control, think about what, what's the best approach that you can take. Number one, how serious is this issue? Many a time, there may be a lot of topicality around the issue that has become a problem, which you need to report on. But when you look at it in the context of the overall project, it's going to be one of the small bumps in the road. And everybody, your boss, leadership, steering groups you may be working with, colleagues, everybody recognizes we have these bumps in the road. So you've got to put it in the context of this is a bump in the road. This is where we can go to get out of it. The second thing is make sure you capture the learning because you don't just want to say you got it and oh, let's move on from here. You want to capture the learning. You want to highlight the learning and say, this is what we've learned from my experience. 
this is how we're going to make sure that we don't do this again. Because the minute you start doing that, you're contextualizing it, not as a huge problem, but as a problem where you've learned something and that's going to lead to some kind of improvement moving forward. So you're putting it in that correct context. Finally, how does this apply to you? Well, honestly, if you're the one who goofed up, the best thing is to own up and say so, that I'm the one who made a mistake here. This is why we have the situation that we've had. But now that I know this is what I've done, this is what I'm doing to rectify the situation. And I'm hoping that I'll get your support. It's not an emotional thing. I'm hoping I'll get your support with, here's the action plan. This is where I think I need my peer support, my boss's support, I know it's going to mean a little bit of extra work and I appreciate that everyone's going to be putting that in. So put it in a business context rather than a, oh my God, what has happened context. And that in itself will completely bring the problem into the level of objectivity that you want. So frame it, contextualize it, be objective about it, and then create a plan and move forward with that plan. Love the delineation of that gives me some really quick things to follow. And, it, and I think what a big thing I'm taking away is remove the emotion for a moment and come at it from a business perspective. Well, Kelly, end us off here with my final question, sort of a different angle of this question. Your proposal was brilliant. So it's no longer a problem that you're presenting. Your proposal was brilliant. Your logic was unassailable. Your argument was impassioned, yet your boss didn't buy it. So what communication or persuasion strategies can you share that can help us present an opportunity and that's going to garner the resources and port for our agenda? Yeah, I, I always say, Lisa, that the best time to present something is not at the time of presentation, meaning you are presenting this, you are, you know, planting the seeds well before it's decision time or it's presentation time. Um, and I think that, you know, one thing that this past year plus has, has definitely reinforced to me is just the value of relationships. So, you know, to end it on a note and, and you know, really summarize, I think a lot of things we've referred to, right? A lot of things depends on the person's style. So know and understand their style. Take time building that relationship to get to know those people who are in that position. So it might be your, your boss that you're trying to influence, but make sure you're building the relationships and you're planting those seeds so that when your idea comes around, you've already had all the people that can um, present different angles, different viewpoints, they've said their piece, you've addressed what those concerns were. So then when the time to present this, finally, everything has been addressed already because you've already pulled in and collaborated with those individuals. I always say start with a person who is polar opposite to where you are. So the person you know is gonna disagree with what, what you're trying to do, grab that person in first and find out why. And, and so I think that that always is very helpful, um, you know, when we're looking at presenting ideas because they might be things we haven't talked about before. I like that, presenting the seeds early on. So it's not gonna be, I'm not getting buy-in for that whole presentation. Be getting the buy-in as you go on or knowing where the buy-in is not gonna happen and knowing where your gaps are, are gonna be in your argument or your presentation. Heath, 30 seconds or less, final thought on presenting opportunities to get support and maybe advance in your career? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. Again, I'll go back to be that person who has the reputation of telling people what they need to hear, not just what they want to hear, but in a way they appreciate hearing it. Uh, number two, management hates bad news. And this is what Supreet was talking about. But what they hate more is bad news late. And so being that person who's able to upfront tell them, hey, this is happening, not just it happened, but, but be that person who, who hopefully gets them the bad news while there's still time to react and change the outcome, that person is going to be invaluable. And if there's two words that if you take away nothing else from all this and how to present things, the two words I want you to remember are business case. And this is a lot of what Kelly was just talking about. Get that person who's completely opposite from you. Find out what they need to help them buy in to whatever your proposal is. Present that as a business case. When you go to the company and say, this is how it's going to benefit the company, that's a lot different than the employees want this or the customers want that. You need to frame things in a way that, that the company or that your audience understands how it benefits them. And that's what's called the business case. What I see most of all where people miss and their presentations and their communications is not framing things on the proper business case. 
Excellent. Wow, thank you, everyone. I can't believe we hit our, hit our hour mark. This has been an enlightening conversation. It's kind of hard to stop. I want to sincerely thank our panelists for their time and their incredible insights. Thank you to our audience for your participation, your questions. You're the reason we get together. So stay tuned for the recording next week and reinforce what you learned today, capture what you missed, and share it with your colleagues, maybe even anonymously to your managers, LOL. And then from here, keep in touch. Reach out to Supreet, Kelly, Heath, and me to share your ideas, ask more information, or gain some coaching assistance, or maybe even to bring a training to your company. And certainly check out a lot of things that came up today. Uh, we have some other insights in the, uh, the other webinars that I've hosted. So check out my YouTube channel. We had a webinar on conflict resolution last month, performance reviews earlier, uh, late last year, and self-onboarding. So check out those other webinars. You might get some more pieces of the puzzle to get further in your career. All right. When we work together, everyone's mission is possible. Happy spring holidays, everyone. I'll see you next time.